With a glint of curiosity in his eye, scrapyard owner Devere Alves Ferreira examined the metal capsule he had recently acquired from a group of local junk collectors. As he examined the capsule, a sudden blue glow caught his attention, emanating from within. Mesmerized by the magical and otherworldly aura, Ferreira made a decision on the spot. Despite the potential profit, he would keep this mysterious find for himself. Although unable to crack open the capsule alone, Ferreira eagerly called his friends and family to share his discovery. He hoped they might be able to help him solve the mystery and figure out how to get inside the thing. And eventually, as hoped, one of his friends was able to crack the capsule open. Immediately, tiny flecks of the glowing internal substance fell to the ground, barely the size of a grain of rice. The group stood in awe. Having never seen anything quite like it, they couldn't help but touch the alien material. Amidst the excitement, Ferreira's wife Maria fell ill. Talking it up to a stomach bug, she left the group that evening to get some rest. The friends and family decided to split up the blue substance and head home for the night. Four days later, having extracted most of the glowing substance, the family decided to sell the remaining scrap metal to a new junkyard, unaware of what they had just encountered. The Ferreira family had just come in close contact with cesium chloride, a highly radioactive substance which would not only ensure tragedy on their family, but lead to one of the worst nuclear radiation disasters in human history. In 1985, the Goiano Institute of Radiotherapy, or IGR, a private institute in Goiania, Brazil, decided to move its operations to a new location. While most of the medical equipment was relocated, a cesium-137 teletherapy unit was left behind due to remaining property disputes. Despite several attempts by the IGR to collect the device, they were blocked by police due to trespassing claims. As a result, the device was left behind, derelict, and abandoned. To make matters worse, the presence of the radioactive device was not properly reported to CNEN, Brazil's governing radiation authority. As the property fell into disrepair and partial demolition, there was no record of the dangerous substance that remained behind. The cesium-137 teletherapy unit became a ticking time bomb, a deadly hazard to anyone who came into contact with it. And with no oversight or safety measures in place, it was only a matter of time before tragedy struck. Roberto dos Santos Alves and Wagner Mota Pereira crept through the crumbling dark tunnels of the abandoned building. They had heard rumors of valuable equipment left behind even after the partial demolition, and they hoped they might be able to find something they could sell for a profit. They were desperate for money, and this seemed as good an opportunity as any. The dark, damp hallways snaked until eventually they found a room with a large metal device. They didn't know what it was, but that wasn't important. It had to be valuable. With the few tools they had brought with them, they carefully dismantled the device piece by piece until they had freed the source assembly, about the size of a can of paint. Carrying their haul, the two men silently made their way out of the building and back to their homes, eager to figure out what they had found and how much they could make. Filled with anticipation and excitement, Alves and Pereira eagerly examined their find before any attempt to sell it. Carefully puncturing the capsule with a screwdriver, they were the first to witness the ethereal blue glow emanating from inside. Overcome with curiosity and the possibility of profit, the men grew more excited, working faster to uncover the contents. But as the night went on, the two men were suddenly overcome with nausea and exhaustion. Talking it up to a bad lunch, they decided to get a good night's rest and make their money the next day when they felt better. However, over the course of the next few days, their symptoms only grew worse. Ferreira developed a severe burn on his hand in the exact location where he had carried the device, while Alves's right forearm became ulcerated and inflamed. Eventually, on September 18th, they found a buyer in the form of a local scrapyard owner, Devere Alves Ferreira. Ferreira, his wife Maria, and their family were as attracted to the otherworldly blue as Alves and Pereira were. Having cracked the capsule open at the gathering and passed out pieces to the different families in attendance, 
The highly toxic cesium-137 was now set free through the city of Guayana, a silent killer which everyone seemingly wanted a piece of. You see, cesium-137 is extremely problematic. It's dispersed easily through the air and with its most common chemical compounds being salts, it's also extremely water-soluble. It spreads quickly and silently and exposure can cause burns, acute radiation sickness, and even death symptoms which were already setting in. Herrera's brother Evo took his share of the glowing material home with him. He excitedly spread some of the dust on the ground and showed his six-year-old daughter Lede the mystical glow. She rubbed it on her skin so she could show off to her mother, like a performer with glitter. Her stage routine ended with breakfast as usual. Without so much as washing her hands, Lede chomped down on her egg sandwich. Within 10 minutes, she was vomiting. By September 28th, Maria Ferreira knew something was not right. She wasn't getting any better and everyone around her was growing ill as well. The only change in their lives during this time was the metal capsule they had encountered days earlier, but by this time they had sold it. Maria tasked an employee of her junkyard to take her and retrieve the capsule, head to the hospital, and figure out once and for all what was going on. They packed the metal scrap into a bag and got on the bus. A packed environment with citizens of all ages, unaware of the horror that just came on board. When they arrived at the hospital, Maria's employee had burns along his back where the bag rested on him. Her desperation was palpable as she pleaded with the doctor to help. She told him this thing was killing her family. The doctor, unsure of what he was dealing with, decided to move the bag containing the metal capsule to a chair in the courtyard, away from other patients and staff. The doctor then sent Maria to another hospital, specializing in tropical diseases, as he figured that was the most likely cause of the sickness. By this time, Maria had not been the first to present with these symptoms. Doctors had started to see a pattern and realized that this was not a typical tropical disease, but rather looked exactly like radiation burns and sickness. They contacted the superintendent of the Toxicological Information Center to investigate further. Fortunately, the superintendent had already been informed of the situation with the metal device, and he put two and two together. They sent a specialist to take measurements of the capsule, and a full-scale investigation was launched to determine the extent of the contamination. As the specialist, a licensed medical physicist, approached the hospital, yet still minutes away, he activated his scintillometer to take a background radiation reading. However, he found the device was picking up off-the-charts radiation levels no matter where he pointed it. Assuming that the instrument must be malfunctioning, he returned to the office to exchange it before continuing with his mission. Yet even with the new device, the readings were still alarmingly high, confirming there was indeed a serious contamination problem. With the situation becoming more clear, they realized that a massive cleanup effort was necessary and immediately sought assistance from the Secretary of Health. The plan was quickly devised to establish a screening location at the local Olympic Stadium. The stadium had a capacity of 13,500 people. However, over 112,000 individuals would make their way through to be screened for exposure. While still chaotic, the situation was finally beginning to come under control as contaminated individuals were identified and isolated for medical attention. The incident also took its toll on the environment. A citywide cleanup effort began. 550 people got to work. Contaminated topsoil was removed. 85 homes and buildings were found with unsafe radiation levels, some of which were demolished in order to eliminate any remaining traces. Animals that had been exposed were put down and personal belongings that were contaminated were disposed of. Paint was scraped off walls, entire roofs were replaced, and concrete was poured to seal in remaining ground radiation. The aftermath of the Goiania incident was devastating. Despite dealing with the radiation, the consequences of the disaster were far-reaching and long-lasting. Out of the 112,000 people screened, 249 tested positive for significant levels of radiation. 
Of those 249, 129 had significant internal contamination, while an additional 1,000 were exposed to more than a year's worth of safe background radiation in just a few days. The tragedy directly claimed the lives of four people, including six-year-old Lede, whose body was so radioactive that anyone close enough to her received the equivalent of a chest x-ray's worth of radiation per minute. Maria Ferreira, who first alerted authorities to the danger, didn't survive either. Her husband, Dever, did survive the radiation, despite severe sickness. Although he recovered physically, he was left without a wife or niece, no home, no business, his animals put down, and guilt and a stigma attached to him, leaving him unable to find a job. He passed away in 1994 due to depression and liver cirrhosis. It's been estimated that more than 104 people have died from cancer since. Even after the radiation had been contained, rumors persisted, and citizens were ostracized by other locales. Sales of the state's products dropped by almost 50% and property values plummeted. Some locals were even banned from renting homes or getting hotels, all due to fear of spreading radiation. The community turned on itself, with protests breaking out over the burial of the irradiated bodies due to fear of further ground contamination. Although the bodies were buried in fiberglass coffins lined with lead and surrounded by concrete, the fear was set in stone first. After the Goiania radiation incident, citizens sought accountability for the devastating consequences. Roberto Alves and Wagner Pereira, the two men who stole the capsule from the hospital, were not charged due to the judge ruling that the property had been abandoned and did not belong to anyone, thus was not stolen. The three doctors who owned and operated the IGR clinic, as well as another former executive and a physicist, were arrested and charged with inflicting fatal wounds. Culpable homicide indictments were prepared against officials at three federal and state agencies due to the lack of proper inspections of the facility over the years. Yet as is often the case, government officials saw their cases dismissed. Only the three doctors and the physicists at IGR were found guilty of anything, manslaughter and causing bodily harm. They were initially sentenced to three years in prison, but the sentence was later reduced to three years home confinement prohibition to practice their professions, community service, and a fine. The fine was later dropped. In 2000, CNEN was finally ordered to pay $750,000 and to guarantee medical and psychological treatment for the direct and indirect victims of the accident and their descendants down to the third generation. However, for many, justice was not fully served and the consequences of the Guayanya radiation incident continue to impact the lives of those involved. <laughs>